Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Thanks for watching Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage Vault Series. The Vault Series is a series of interviews that we shot starting back in 2004, two years before the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum opened to the public. If you like what you see, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Thanks for watching. Today's clip is with Motown studio guitarist Joe Messina. Born in Detroit, 1928, December. I always call it 1929 because it's near the end. Uh, born and raised here. Uh, didn't leave Michigan until Motown went on the road with Standing in the Shadows of Motown. <laughs> that was when you left? That's when you actually... Went actually, out. first time on the road, yes. And it was strange, and I still don't like being on the road. <laughs> oh. So when, when did that happen exactly? When did you actually hit the road? Well, we did the show. We uh, did the um, movie in, I think it was 2000, and two years later, 2002, we started the tour. And uh, when we got to Europe, I decided I was finished. I didn't want to do it anymore. So that's when I left the band at the end of 2000. I think it was February 2003. When we got to Europe, people know more about us and our songs than I did. Of course, I never knew much about our songs anyway because I recorded them and when I left the studio, I didn't have a chance to play them again. So I didn't know the songs. So uh, when we had rehearsals, they'd say, we're going to play such and such a song. I would ask them, how does it go? Because I had no idea. So I'd have to listen. But it all worked out okay in the end. Did you start with guitar? Yes, guitar was my only instrument, yes. What was your first guitar? Uh, it was a Gibson L7, I believe it was. It was my dad's. So how did you get into the studio? Oh, uh, I was playing a uh, nightclub, a jazz club called 20 Grand in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And Barry Gordy came in and he asked me if I would record for him. I said, sure. He says, come on down and see me Monday. And I did. We struck up a deal. Uh, Barry was paying the guys $5 a song. So when he called me in to work, he said he would offer me $10 a song. Well, I told him, uh, if you give me $10 an hour, he claimed that they could do four or five songs in an hour. I said, just give me $10 an hour, and uh, if we do more than that, the songs will be on me. He says, okay, you're going to be sorry, though. Uh, so when they called the session for 10 o'clock, of course, I would show up at 10 and they would come strolling in maybe noon, so I already made a couple of hours in into my program. And um, that went on for about two, three months, and finally Barry called me and he says, Joe, I can't afford you anymore. He, says, <laughs> he can't afford you $10 a song, right? He right, $10, yeah. 10, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, he said he'll call me when they go union, and it was shortly after that, maybe a couple of weeks that he called me. And uh, that's how we started. Then we were put on a salary, so we wouldn't work for anyone else. I was one of the first to be there at the uh, studio. Joe Hunter had a little band there for a while, and then uh, I became part of the band. And I stayed with them, and Joe left. Uh, I don't know why, but he just wasn't there one day. <laughs> but I stayed. I was with them from that until the very end. So how long, how long was Joe there before he left? I think Joe was there about two years, short while. Um, so, do you remember the first session you played on? Oh, I remember one of the early sessions. It was Holland, Dozier, and Holland. Those guys were beautiful. They came in with a chord sheet. It might have had three, possibly four chords at the most. And they would say, run this down. So as we're running it down, we sort of feel what we think would fit. So as we were doing that, they would keep it. So we arranged it for them. Didn't know we were doing it. And that's how that worked out. But that's the way the early sessions were. No music, just chord sheets. And sometimes not even that. Do you remember the first big hit you had out of Motown? I don't remember the song, but I remember we were playing the session and they told us that we had a number one hit song. Well, it didn't mean much to me because it was just a job, you know. I had no idea that it would represent anything to me other than that it was going to make money for the company. That was our first big one.
This may sound weird, but did you enjoy the Motown? Did you enjoy playing those sessions? I did. I considered it just another job, but I did have fun. The guys are really funny. They are really funny. I, I used to laugh every day. There's always something going on. We were really like brothers. Hence the name. Without the fighting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, hence the name. <laughs> um, but being a jazz, I mean, definitely, well, some of that music has a lot of jazz influence in it, though. It, it has, yes. The feel, yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of the musicians were jazz players. In fact, uh, I don't remember anyone in the band listening to what we recorded. We'd all, after leaving the session, put on our jazz programs. At that time, I, fi I find it so amazing that it, in one particular place in the country, that at one particular time, that this guy says, I'm, I'm going to start a record label. Yeah. And then he's able to go out. First off, he was Samuel Star record level. That's pretty strong. Yes. Then to be able to, to, go, to go out and find not just players, but players. Yeah. That he can come in there and, and do this historical music with. Yeah. And not just players, but writers. Yes. Yes. And th I mean, it's just it's just so incredible that all that would happen to be. That you know that, that all you guys would be here within this certain geographic center. Yes. Within this certain time, within this certain age group. Yes. Strange how it happened, isn't it? It's it's really amazing. Barry is uh, a jazz. He's a lover of jazz. He really is a. He likes jazz, I should say. And uh, I think he appreciated what the guys were doing. You know? It's just that things. Uh, fortunately for us, we could adapt. And things changed as we were playing there. Because when we first started out, we were all jazz players, but we knew the rock and roll type of feeling with the black feel to go with it. But, but Detroit wasn't known as a music town. Not at, at all. That time. <laughs> no. It's not like saying, I'm going to go to Nashville and start something. I'm yes. Like, there was already a, a bunch of singers hanging out looking for gigs and right. players and stuff. I mean, here, you know, he had the Supremes and the Temptations. Yes. And... Smokey and and Dozier Holland Dozier and all of these people all and then the session guys yes on top of it yeah and to I mean to me it's just beyond a coincidence it's amazing how it worked out isn't it is yes. beyond that I yep. just can't it's really you know if you try to think about all that lining up at one time yes and and a, you know somebody just was to close their eyes and throw a, a dart in the, in the, it hit Detroit. It was a city that would happen in. You throw another dart. <laughs> well, you throw, you know, get away from it. Think about it. You know, yeah. No, not Detroit. No. Not Detroit, yeah. no. But, uh, but there you go. You know, so, I mean, uh, just like, uh, you know, I wish, I wish I'd uh, had some insight about Vegas 70 years ago. You know, I mean, who would have thought the desert would have turned into what, yeah. what it is. And, uh, I was thinking about uh, them putting my name on the, the labels after a while they, they had to put our names on there, especially when we went to Europe. And I was, I was just thinking back, what would Italians think? Now, wait a minute, you said something. They had to put your name on it? They finally had to put our names on it. Yeah, they weren't doing that before. Now, that's a good question. Why? Yeah, I don't know why. It just, they never did put our names on the record, or, or the jacket for that matter, until uh, they start making them for Europe. Or out of the country and then they they wanted to know whose musicians were there well I was thinking uh, being Italian and the name Messina being Italian and a black record company I could see them reading the list of names and they come to Messina and say no no that's not right they misspelled it <laughs> it's got to be somebody else <laughs> was there any particular uh, group or, or uh, singer or whatever that you played for in Motown that you enjoyed the most or um, I enjoyed all of them uh, but Marvin Gaye was the easiest going of all of them and Holland Dozier and Holland they let you do what you want but Marvin Gaye was he was a musician he played nice piano played drums and just let you go mm -hmm. beautiful how about the musicians I mean um, how do, like obviously you're a jazz player who, who um, Robert White, 
did like the the lead part on my girl did you yes. do other leads like that you know? uh there were a few but i can't remember what they were because uh some tunes that we did were never exposed so uh not sure which ones made it or not they always yes they used, in fact at times i remember doing a session with barry and he'd come around to me and he'd say play this part and he'd sing a part so i played it and then the second producer would come around and say no don't play that play this and i'd play his part and then Barry would come around again and say, I didn't tell you to play that, play this. And they did that about three times, and finally I stood up. I very rarely spoke at the sessions. I said, I'll play anything you want, but make up your mind what you want. How did it feel to meet the president? It was wonderful. It was, uh, food was great. <laughs> he, uh, he uh, for some reason, when they introduced me to him, he, he looked a little bit dumbfounded. And I told my wife, I said, uh, it looked like he was surprised somehow i don't know why and she she commented she said well maybe he thought you were going to be black <laughs> i never thought of it you know? <laughs> looked like he was stunned like you know <laughs> it was nice he didn't say uh i said mr president it's a pleasure to meet you and he said nothing he just he was just dumbfounded at that moment <laughs> but the food was good <laughs> how did um how how did that come about it was Black History Month, and uh, they had black for performers performing. And we were going to perform, but they had too many performers at that time, so we were just guests. And uh, it was fun. It was really nice. <laughs> Tell me about the uh, about the guitar you have there. Oh, the guitar! Mm -hmm. It's a standard uh, standard Telecaster. Not nothing's modified on it, uh, except for the neck. I took the. Uh, the neck from a uh, jazz master guitar and the reason I did that was because it's smoother all the way around and it felt comfortable mm -hmm. and and uh, it seemed a lot easier to play it was smooth but I liked the sound of the bass uh, and the treble combined I could get the, all the jazz players were playing this deep muddy uh, uh, deep sound a lot of bass and I like mine with a little bit more treble so the the uh, lower notes were a little more distinctive and that's why I went with this model and I really like it and I stayed with it real long how did you get a uh, how did you go about getting a jazz neck on a okay I'll turn this around on a telly body there's four screws back here and you unloosen those screws and the, the neck just comes right off and when I put this on, fortunately, it stayed straight because I thought it was going to be bent a bit, but it, it worked out real nice for me. I was really lucky. I think it's the only one in the, in the world that I know of. I mean, so how did you get it? I mean, how did you acquire, the, did you take another guitar apart? Oh, yes. No, what happened was uh, I did a favor for the Fender people. They had no one representing them at a music store, so I went and did it for them, and they started giving me my amplifiers and uh, instruments. So they gave me... Uh, this guitar and I asked for this neck and they gave me one so they so they made it for you well, actually I did it I just asked for the parts oh okay I asked for the neck and I and so uh, they sent you just a neck and yep, a body yep no body I had the body already oh, okay and and I ordered uh, I told them I wanted the neck mm -hmm. and so, they gave me one they had so one so that's that about a uh uh, 66 or so oh, I'm really bad with that I'm I'm not sure what it is the year you're talking about the year yeah. right yeah I, I don't know I was asked that question too not too well, long ago let me see the tuning gears in the back of the headstock I'm sorry can you turn it over and see? sure okay no, there's really old, nothing special that's, that's, older. that's about probably about a 60 uh, early 60s early is 60s, it? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's what I was thinking but I wasn't sure but I really mm -hmm. like it and it's comfortable my other guitar that I used at the station also was, uh, is a Tele, but I did not change the neck on that one. I just left it as it was. Very cool. When you were playing in Motown, yep. what, on those records, what, what amplifier did you use then? We went through, at first we used to bring our own amps. Then we went through a monitor amp. Uh, it's on the back of the wall where I sit. It's be, right directly behind me. And we put the bass and three guitars through that amp it had four outlets and uh you know you always want to hear your part so you crank it up a little bit 
and uh, we'd crank it. Next thing you know, we all had them way up. But it didn't matter because they had true control in the uh, in the room in the control booth. They did whatever they wanted with us. So actually, they didn't have a mic on the amp then, did they? No, we so went you're, directly. So you were going direct to the board. Right. Yes. Yes. That's, that's wild. So it didn't matter what tone we had. They they asked me to bring my acoustic. In fact, I used that black one I was telling you about. And they wanted me to play an acoustic kind of rhythm. I think it was for Smokey. And uh, they gave me a little line plus playing the rhythm. And when I heard the playback, it sounded like the Fender. They heard that in their mind, you know, instead of a, a real acoustic sound. So I was thinking, boy, what a waste. Yeah. <laughs> what a waste. Did you, did you do that more than once? I did it several times, yeah. I'd be in, in a booth by myself. Uh, I'd say at maybe 10 times. The black guitar? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, th but that, the amplifier they had there didn't have a name on it? No, I think they made it themselves. Really? Yeah, homemade. How are The only thing it had on it, you know, you know when you, when the, uh, you would know about this, in the control booth they have these things that the peak. The E-meters. E-meters, yeah. The, the That's e the only thing we had. Each guitar and, and bass had their own, separate. So we knew when we were peaking. You had a VU meter and that was all? That's all, yeah. So even when Jamerson was playing his Fender bass? He the, went through there. He went through there. And when I doubled him, I went through the same amp, yeah. When you doubled him? I played his, sometimes I'd play his parts with him. Really? Yeah, because I could read bass clef, so. So you like tic tac line with him? I, yeah, I loved playing with him, yeah. We'd both play the same part. Sometimes I would play the line and they would let him go free. But most most times it was he and I both did the same part. Does they have line, did, did, did the writers have the bass line written out for him? Or? A lot of times they did, yes. Yeah. Unless it was a steady pattern thing. Uh, and then we'd alter it for each chord. But uh, other than that, they, they really got sophisticated near the end. Uh, they had... Uh, they had music for everything. In fact, I don't think they could have, I, I was thinking in my mind that they couldn't have a session unless they had music or a title for the song. But at the end they had arrangements. And the guitar parts were not written like um, regular music. We sort of had a score. So we knew what uh, violins were doing, uh, approximately, and the horns. So they had them written out, so if we had to double any of those, it would be right there. If there was a rhythm thing, I would usually take that, like uh, Latin, you know. Smokey liked those things, and uh, that would be my part. Uh, and then sometimes they would want that sharp backbeat, and I had the guitar for it. So that would be my part. One day they wanted all three of us to play it, so I, I had uh, uh, Robert White play the low backbeat, Eddie in the center, and I took the high backbeat. It sounded great. It was good. So did you guys automatically know what, what who was going to do what, pretty much? Well, Eddie couldn't read. Eddie uh, Willis. So if there was any funk thing, it was his automatically because he had the freedom to do it, you know. But Eddie was, he, he's good. Sometimes they wanted him to play a special part that was written. Mm -hmm. So he'd, I would play it for him, teach mm -hmm. it to him, and right. he learned it right away. And he'd... He got it. And then he'd put the, he'd do it. Yeah. He put his style to it. Right. Yes. Yeah. And how about Robert? Robert was a good reader. Robert was very precise. He almost played like a white boy. He was <laughs> so perfect, you know. <laughs> um, Sometimes you want a little here and there to give a nice feeling, but huh. he was sucking uh -huh. right there. Beautiful. Good player. Um, he played with his thumb. Yeah. Like um, Wes. Um, did, and did all three of y'all play at the same time on most of these records? Yes, yes. A lot of times uh, they might give me a pattern uh, and give uh, Robert, might even play backbeat sometimes, and uh, give Eddie and I would play a, play a pattern, or Robert and Eddie would play a pattern. Uh, they, they, they found a way to use, utilize us. And, and if, they couldn't, if they couldn't think of anything, they'd say play backbeat or strum. What was the, uh, the drummer you remember the most? Or is there one? 
I remember Pistol the most for some reason. And Benny. Of course, in the beginning, it was strictly Benny. <clears throat> Benny was who they called uh, uh, Papa, Papa, Papacita. Papacita. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Benny was funny. <laughs> Benny was always late. Huh. You probably heard the story, I'll tell you that anyway. <laughs> he was always late and he'd come up with some flimsy excuse. His grandmother died again, uh, things like that. <laughs> but this one time he come in and he said, I was driving and when I hit Woodward Avenue, I couldn't get across because there was an elephant there. So, <laughs> so he lied so many times, you know, go, yeah, sure, sure. And we come to find out they had a parade and there really was an elephant walking. <laughs> <laughs> For once he tells the truth, no one believes him. So he him. cried wolf. <laughs> yes. That's funny. Now, Uriel? Uriel, yes. Um, when did he come in the same? Uriel come in near the end that I could recall. For a while there it was uh, Benny, and then Benny and Pistol, and then uh, a lot of sessions there was just Uriel, and then there was Uriel, and... Of course, Benny passed away, so it ended up being Uriel and um, Pistol together. A lot of times we used both drummers. So you had two drummers at one time? Like all Most times we did, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. I actually didn't know that. And these kids that were copying our records played their parts, <laughs> both of them. Played two parts of one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Someone told me that. They said they were trying to play it, and they did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the date that, that um, Motown left? When they left? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the story goes that uh, they closed the door on us and uh, we weren't allowed in the studio. Uh, that's not true because we knew like a month in advance. And then we were reminded again two weeks before it happened. So we were all prepared. But it makes good movie story. <laughs> that was, uh, I forget the year. But I, at that time, I, I, I had enough. I was doing too much with the commercials, playing nightclubs in the hotel and the studio. Did you keep in touch with the guys after the closed down? I did not. In fact, I don't really know the guys that well because uh, after the session, I wouldn't hang out with them because I had to go to another gig. It was very rare that I would stick around more than 10 minutes and uh, I would take off, but they, they hung together, which, which was nice for them. You know? I'm just sorry I missed that part, because on the bus they were really funny. I bet. <laughs> yeah, a riot. <laughs> um, do you, did you ever or you keep in touch with um, Barry Gordy? No. Barry, uh, I saw Barry, they, they had a... Uh, uh, they were giving an award to Holland Dozier and Holland, and Barry was there. And I wanted to talk with him, but as soon as the show was over with, I took off and went up to my room to change my clothes. And uh, when I came back down, he was gone already. But he asked for me, which was nice. Barry's a sweetheart. He's, oh, he's, he's like Marvin Gaye, so easy going. And is he, he lives in California now, didn't he? Uh, that's his home now, yeah, uh -huh. from what I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's part of his success. Uh, he'll go with the flow. I think I think that's part of his success. And and uh, Marvin Gaye's too. They don't make any waves. They just yeah. take what's coming ahead. If they don't like it, they just get rid of it. Well, that was an amazing uh, amazing story and ride to be on. <laughs> yes, it was. Very and proud. For, yes. And for it to come back again. Oh God, yes, coming back again, my goodness, unbelievable. Uh, of all the jobs I had, I figured Motown to be the least important. So I didn't devote uh, much attention. Of course, I did take care of business, but uh, much attention as I did the others. I figured they were my, my money, that was my money music. Mm -hmm. And Motown was for fun, and uh, it was a job, and it, it ended up being the good one. <laughs> yeah.